Hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors, Novartis, Pfizer, Ipsen, and Recordati, and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their healthcare providers. The PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in your questions at any time. Please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have a lot of time to answer as many questions as possible. Today's webinar, Pituitary Tumors, is presented by Dr. Michael Brisman. Now please hold as there will be a brief delay while we change presenters. Okay. All right. Uh, can everybody hear me now? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, great. All right. Hi. So I'm Dr. Michael Brisbane. Thanks for having me, and I hope this will be helpful for people who listen now or listen at a later time. I'm a neurosurgeon. Uh, my father was a neurosurgeon, and my brother is a neurosurgeon who works with me. I practice on Long Island, New York, where I've been practicing for about 24 years. And I specialize in brain tumors, including uh, pituitary tumors, as well as trigeminal neuralgia as a type of facial pain. So today I'll be talking to you about pituitary tumors. And um, again, we'll have a question and answer session at the end, and I'll try to answer as best as I can and try to make this as you know informative as possible. Um, so first I'll talk just about the pituitary gland itself. Um, a gland is something that makes hormones that act elsewhere in the body and the pituitary gland is often referred to as the master gland because the pituitary gland sends out hormones into the bloodstream that affect other glands and tell those glands when to release their hormones. So it's the gland that kind of controls the other glands in the body. Um, there's a, a front and a back part of the pituitary gland. The front part is called the anterior pituitary gland, and the back part is called the posterior pituitary gland. It, it, it's a small gland in the, the bottom front part of the head. I'll show you some pictures soon of that. And just to, to give you a sense of all the things that the pituitary gland regulates, it's actually a lot of things. So the anterior pituitary gland First is it produces a hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, which affects metabolism. This is the, the, the hormone that tells the adrenal gland to release cortisol, and you need to have cortisol or a certain amount of steroid in the body to live. Um, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is also involved in metabolism, and this signals the thyroid gland to release thyroid hormones which are also necessary throughout life to live. You have to have a certain amount of thyroid hormone, or it can be replaced with certain medicines that provide those hormones. Uh, growth hormone, um, which is involved in growth and is necessary when a person's growing. I mean, in adulthood, it's not really clearly critical, but certainly as a, in order for a person to grow from a child to an adult, you need growth hormone. Um, Follicle-stimulating hormone, um, and luteinizing hormone, which are important in uh, fertility, um, and prolactin, which is important in lactation. Um, when a, so those are the anterior pituitary gland hormones, and then the posterior pituitary gland hormone. Uh, one is antidiuretic hormone, which is involved in water resorption. So you pretty much do need to have that hormone your whole life. If you don't have that, a person develops something called diabetes insipidus and just urinates clear water like massive amounts all the time. And in, I mean, in order to live, you would have to just drink water nonstop. So you pretty much do need to have that hormone and oxytocin, which is involved in uterine contraction. So again, some of these hormones are necessary for life and have to be replaced if, if, if you don't have them. Some of them are 
important for certain parts of life, like growing up or or reproducing. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. So just to show the anatomy of the pituitary gland. So here's a side view of the head. Here's going to be here's the nose. This this part here is the brain, and this this thing here is the pituitary gland. It's connected to the hypothalamus, which is this this piece of brain here. The hypothalamus is is the part of brain that is just under the thalamus. So it's called the thalamus is up here, so it's called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is actually the the organ that directs the pituitary gland what to do. It's and uh, and the the hypothalamus is directly connected to the pituitary gland through this stalk. So this is the pituitary gland is actually a pretty small um, structure, but it, it has a lot of critical things that it does. So it's connected to the rest of the brain by the pituitary stalk. It sits under the optic nerve. So here are the optic nerves that are coming out that are going to go to either eye. And if a pituitary tumor should grow large enough, it could start to press on the optic nerves and cause vision problems. And on either side of the pituitary gland, and I'll, I'll show you a better view next, is some, it, are structures called the cavernous sinus. So this is just showing the anatomy of the pituitary gland. We'll go to the next slide. So uh, on this slide here, it, it shows the relation, it's a magnified, super magnified view of the hypothalamus, and the relationship to the anterior, the front part of the pituitary gland, and the back, the posterior part of the pituitary gland. The front part of the, of the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary gland, the hypothalamus sends out certain uh, releasing or inhibiting factors through this blood supply to tell the anterior pituitary gland, which creates these hormones, when to release the hormones. The posterior pituitary gland is, is sort of some people feel it's like really just an, a direct extension of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus creates the hormones that, that it then sends to the posterior lobe, which the posterior gland then stores until the hypothalamus tells the posterior gland to release those hormones. So it's a little bit different. This is a side view of the, I'm sorry, a, a view like a coronal where we're slicing. Imagine if we're taking slices of the face starting at the nose, going back towards the head. And this would be a view of a pituitary gland with a small tumor in it. Here's a little tumor. This is the gland here. Uh, this is the stalk. And on this view, this is where the, the optic nerves lie above the stalk. So if, if a tumor should grow a certain height, it could press on the optic nerves and cause vision trouble in one eye or the other or both. Typically, the tumors that do grow up into the optic nerves grow into the optic chiasm in the middle, and the middle part of the optic chiasm is what controls vision on the sides of, of, of vision. So often, it'll cause what's called like a tunnel vision, where a person can see things in the middle, but has trouble seeing things off to the sides, and a person could present, for example, by accidentally bumping their car against the side of the garage because part of their visual field was, was defective and they didn't realize it. And then showing off to the side are the cavernous sinuses. The cavernous sinuses are, are mostly a conglomerate or, or a, a bunch of veins, but inside this venous complex are other important things, including the carotid artery here on either side, and also several nerves, the third, fourth, uh, two of the divisions of the fifth nerve and the sixth nerve. The third, fourth, and sixth nerves are the nerves that control movement of the eye um, on either side. The fifth, fifth nerve, the first and second division, control the sensation to the face in the upper and middle part of the face. Usually, the cavernous sinus is not affected by pituitary tumors, but it can be if the tumor should grow off a lot off onto the side. And particularly if the tumor suddenly enlarges, like let's say there's a bleed within the tumor, it can present with not only vision defect, but it can it can burst a little bit into the sides here and cause some double vision because some of these nerves might not be working in the cavernous sinus. And then underneath this area here is called the sphenoid sinus, this airspace. I'll just show you back on the prior view. The This is one... One of the air spaces is called the sphenoid sinus. We have different sinuses 
um, in front of the face. This is the frontal sinus. But the sphenoid sinus is relevant to us because when we're doing a surgical approach to the pituitary, almost always we use a root, a surgical approach that goes through the sphenoid sinus, and that's why it's called transphenoidal, because we're going trans through the sphenoid sinus to get to the pituitary gland. So pituitary tumor classifications. So if, if it's if it's under a centimeter, it's called a a microadenoma. And just so people are aware, microadenomas are incredibly common. People have done autopsy studies just to look at, you know, normal people who didn't know that they had a pituitary tumor, and they find that as much as 20 to 25 percent of normal people happen to have a tiny, tiny, benign tumor in their pituitary gland if you really look carefully enough. So tiny pituitary tumors that are not producing any hormone are actually extremely common. Um, micro, and, and sometimes we'll find these incidentally on an MRI. Somebody gets an MRI because they bumped their head or they had some other issue and they're found to have a pituitary tumor. And usually these are not necessarily a cause of concern. If a tumor is above more, a centimeter or more in size, it's called a macroadenoma. A centimeter is about, I don't know, maybe the size of a marble. Um, this is an MRI, which is the most commonly used tool to look at pituitary tumors, and it shows a typical macroadenoma. This tumor looks to be about, from here to here is maybe about two centimeters. It's pushing up the optic nerves. This person might have some visual field problems. Um, just to show all the anatomy here that on an MRI that we can see, this structure here is the tongue. Um, these are the nasal passages here, and we usually go through the nasal passages into this, the sphenoid sinus, this airspace, to get to the tumor when we're going to operate. Um, this is all the brain here, uh, the, and this is the neck. This is the, the front and back part of the neck bone, and here's the spinal cord. So pituitary tumors are also classified based on their hormone status. And what we mean by that is, first of all, does the tumor produce a hormone or not? So it kind of, the pituitary gland has different cells in it. Some cells are producing certain types of hormones. Some cells aren't producing any hormones. And depending on where the tumor originated, I mean, the tumors originate from, like any tumor, starts from one cell. And the cell that tells the tumor how often to grow has nucleus and DNA, the DNA tells the cell how fast to grow. And if there's a, a defect in the part of the DNA that controls growth, you get a tumor. And for pituitary tumors, it's always almost always a benign defect. It makes a slow growing tumor. Uh, a, a cancerous tumor would have a serious defect in the DNA that causes the tumor to grow quickly and can spread to other areas. And the good news about pituitary tumors is they're almost all benign. It's very, very, very rare for a pituitary tumor uh, to be malignant. So, but the hormone status, the, one of the common ones is non-secretory. That is, it doesn't produce any hormone. Now, it is possible that if, even if a tumor is non-secretory, that if it's squishing the normal pituitary gland, some of the normal hormones can be decreased. So it can affect the hormone status if it's compressing the normal pituitary gland also, by the way, the pituitary stalk, if that's compressed um, by a tumor of any kind, including a non-secretory tumor, that can cause some mild elevation in the prolactin level because the stalk sends signals to the pituitary gland to not produce prolactin. So if the stalk is compressed, you can get some elevation of prolactin. But so there are tumors that are primarily non-secretory that aren't themselves making hormones then you can also get tumors that are producing hormones. And while theoretically you can get tumors that are producing any hormones, the three main type, I mean, that comprise 99% of the tumors that are producing hormones are going to be tumors that produce prolactin, which are called prolactinomas, tumors that produce an excess of adrenocorticotrophic hormone, which are going to tell the adrenal gland to produce extra cortisol or extra steroid, and that leads to Cushing's disease. And then there are tumors that cause, that, that produce an excess of growth hormone, which 
can cause, if it occurs in a child, it can cause gigantism uh, where the, the child is still growing and the person can turn into a, a giant. Um, and if it occurs in, in later as an adult, once the bones are fused, the person doesn't get extra tall, but it can cause more commonly uh, what's called acromegaly, where you have enlargement of the facial features of the hands, of the feet, and of the heart and the liver. Uh, and, and of note, Cushing's disease and acromegaly are serious diseases that can shorten life expectancy because an extra amount of steroid or an extra amount of growth hormone can affect other organs. The, the extra steroid can cause uh, diabetes, hypertension, um, other problems that, that can be serious. And acromegaly can cause enlargement of the heart or liver. It can cause heart arrhythmias. So we def those are problems that we definitely want to try to address, even if those tumors were tiny. So presentation of pituitary tumors, I mean, one of the very common ways that a tumor will present is incidentally. We, we, in, in other words, we just happen to find it. Somebody gets an MRI for some reason or another that they, they they got dizzy, they bumped their head, and we happen to find a very tiny tumor. And more and more as MRIs are, and imaging becomes more available to people, incidental discoveries are very common. And if it's a small tumor that isn't producing hormone, we'll usually just follow it. Another common presentation is gonna be gradual presentation, such as Cushing's disease or acromegaly, where or or with prolactinomas where a person will notice, you know what, I, I have diet, I've noticed over time I have high blood pressure, I have diabetes, I have a swollen face, hey, I have Cushing's disease, or, you know, over several years I've noticed my facial features are enlarging, my hands are getting swollen, my feet are getting bigger, um, I have acromegaly, or I'm having you know, fertility problems, my menstrual periods are irregular, and it's a, a, an excess of prolactin, or hey, my, you know, my vision has been gradually deteriorating. But most of the time, pituitary tumors, when they are symptomatic, they're causing symptoms, not being found incidentally, develop gradually. However, it is also possible for a pituitary tumor to present symptomatically in a sudden manner, and that is called pituitary apoplexy. And that can happen in one of two ways either the pituitary tumor can bleed into itself, which is rare but can happen, or the pituitary tumor can have a stroke into itself. So it, it, it is so big that it squeezes off some of its blood supply and it suddenly swells. So in either of these cases, the, it can be life-threatening and can cause some serious problems. If the, if the tumor suddenly bleeds or suddenly swells due to a stroke, suddenly that tumor can, is, is a lot bigger than it was or can be, and it can cause loss of vision or blindness. It can cause uh, cavernous sinus involvement, which can cause double vision. It can cause also um, sudden um, effect to the normal hormone status. So suddenly a person isn't producing any steroid cortisol or thyroid hormone, which you need to live. So Someone with apoplexy may need to be, you know, often need to be hospitalized, may need hormone replacement, may need urgent surgery, um, observation. So apoplexy um, can be a serious and can be life-threatening or, or threaten blindness, depending on how bad it is. Pituitary tumor management, there are sort of several categories of things that we can do for pituitary tumors. One is going to be to observe it which is something you might do if it's a small non-secretory tumor, if it's a tumor that's discovered incidentally, um, if it's someone who's elderly or has a limited life expectancy, if it's a small prolactinoma that isn't bothering somebody, but certainly observation more and more is gonna be very reasonable as we discover more and more of these tumors incidentally. And as I've mentioned, a lot of people, if you, as more, if you MRI their brain, you'll find a very, very tiny pituitary growth. Uh, another option in management is medicines. Medicines can be used to replace hormones if the hormone is too low. They, med certain medicines can be used to lower hormones if they're too high. And sometimes 
medicines can also be used to reduce the size of the tumor. This, particularly if a tumor is a prolactinoma. Prolactinomas can respond dramatically to, to medicines, particularly um, bromocryptine or cabergoline, also known as Dostinex. And these medicines not only can normalize the elevated prolactin level, but they can shrink the tumor and you know, very rapidly reduce symptoms such as vision problems. On the right, I just show an example of the effect of medicines on a prolactinoma. So here's a side view of the brain. Here's a very large tumor. And just, you know, the, the two most common types of tumors are non-secretory tumors and prolactinomas. But here's a very large tumor, a side view, and here's a coronal view looking face on um, that looks very, very big. And this person probably had a prolactin in the thousands. Uh, normal prolactin is, let's say, zero to 20. And after giving medicine, the tumor and a person stays on this medicine, the tumor, not only is the prolactin normal, but the tumor has dramatically shrunk away and it's likely the vision gets better and symptoms are improved. And, and as a result, it's rare that we need to operate on prolactinomas because the medicines are so effective at normalizing the prolactin level as well as shrinking the tumor to very tiny sizes. And then another option is gonna be surgery, which almost always is gonna be through the transphenoidal route, which means through the nose, through the sphenoid sinus like this. And usually we're, within the transphenoidal route, we're usually using the endoscopic route, which means we put a, a scope uh, through either nostril. And most, of, most neurosurgeons we will often use an ear, nose, and throat doctor to put the scope in and hold the scope while we work on the tumor. Although so, some people try to do both at the same time, I find that a little, more, more challenging. Um, the, one of the er, older ways of doing the transnoidal approach that didn't involve endoscopy, we would make a little incision uh, in the upper gum or in the nose and then put a, a, a retractor in um, and bring in a microscope. But now more, more and more we're using the endoscope, it's just less invasive. And then another uh, form of treatment is with very focused radiation and there was a lot of reluctance in the past to use radiation because radiation used to be very, uh, it used to cover a very wide area and cause a lot of problems uh, for a lot of things, for the brain, for other things. But now that we have super focused radiation, it's something that, that I use routinely and it's, the radiation is really focused right on the tumor and doesn't really affect much as far as the rest of the brain. So it's, it's an excellent uh, treatment to use for tumors after surgery if there's residual or recurrent disease. Um, so here's just like a general, I mean, my general management algorithm, and this isn't always exactly right, but just to go over. So if it's a non-secretory tumor and it's tiny, usually I'll, I'll just leave it alone. I mean, if it's a big tumor, then often, usually the first line will be transphenoidal to remove it. But stereotactic radiosurgery, the focus radiation might be a second line treatment um, if there's tumor left, if tumor occurs. And sometimes if the tumor is a macroadenoma, but it's not causing symptoms or pressing the optic nerves, one might just primarily do radiosurgery. Um, secretory tumors, the prolactinomas, if they're not causing a problem, one might just leave it alone. If it's causing problems like, like infertility, um, or vision problems, or it's big, we would usually treat it just with medicines alone. Again, it's rare that these need to be operated on. I mean, an exception might be a tumor that's just not responding to the medicines, or the medicines aren't tolerated well by the person, or the tumor suddenly has a big bleed and is causing vision problems for that reason, and we need to remove the tumor. But it's, again, most prolactinomas we do not operate on. Acromegaly and Cushing's disease, usually we will try first to operate on these because sometimes we can cure them with, with surgery or at least take out a good portion of them. Um, and if there's residual, I will usually, again, fall back on the focus radiation. I mean, if a tumor is enormous, we may have to use regular radiation, but rarely do we need regular radiation anymore. Usually it's super focused radiation in either one or five sessions. And there are also medicines that can be used in acromegaly and Cushing's cases that can help normalize or lower the high level of growth hormone or the high level of cortisol if 
the surgery or the focused radiation are, are not fully effective at normalizing the hormones. And again, in any of these cases, if the hormones are too low, we can re replace them with hormone replacement. As I've mentioned, those include Synthroid, if the thyroid level is low, hydrocortisone, if the cortisol level is low, um, if the, um, the, the hormone that controls water, uh, your, your excess urination is low, we can give a medicine called DDAVP or desmopressin that can replace that. And some people have low testosterone with or without a pituitary tumor, and that can also be replaced. So just to show the the, the main surgical route, and, and again, I mean, this is going to be true for over 99% of pituitary tumors. Again, there could be some extremely rare tumors that are, you know, growing up into here or off to the sides that we might do a formal craniotomy or, or an operation through the skull, but that is extremely, extremely rare. Most of the surgery is done, again, through the sphenoid sinus. Here's the sphenoid sinus, and most of the time, we're doing it with, with our ENT, our ear, nose, and throat colleague. They put a little scope into either nostril. The scope, we come into this airspace. And then this, this part, this is the bone where the pituitary sits is called the cella tersica, which just means Turkish saddle, because I guess it, I don't know, somebody thought it looked like a saddle at some point. But this bone is usually thinned out from a tumor if it's big. We, we make a little hole in the bone, and then the tumor, 95% of the time, is pretty mushy, like oatmeal, and we can use little curettes, little uh, long, narrow instruments to gradually encourage the tumor to come out, because it's usually very soft and mushy. There are times when the tumor is very firm, and you just can't get it, you can't safely remove it. And I'll also say that there are different styles or concepts with removing these. My own personal feeling with these is I go, I take what comes out easy. I feel that one should go in there and be very, very gentle. Things that, you know, trouble that you can run into if you try to get over aggressive and remove every drop of the tumor. One is you can get release of cerebrospinal fluid, of the brain fluid that normally bathes the brain. And if that happens, sometimes I will, or often I will put a drain in the back during the surgery and maybe put a little piece of fat from the leg into the nose to try to seal up the leak for a few days. Um, so I think if one is gentle, one can avoid that. I think also being gentle avoids causing hypopituitarism or a, a, a lowering of the normal pituitary hormone function, which may need replacement. So it all, and also reduces the risk of other injuries, of vision problems, of other things. So I go in there, I take out whatever part, the tumor comes out easily. And, and often a lot of the tumor will come out, sometimes almost all of it, sometimes part of it. And then I, one can follow it up very safely and easily with the focused radiation and other medicines. Some people tend to be more aggressive and try to get every drop out, which again, I think is unnecessary, but there are different philosophies to these things. But for me, this is, you know, I go in there, I try to do what, what, tumor wants to come out easily. This operation takes about an hour, at least the way I do it, and people usually go home the next day. I keep them overnight in the intensive care unit, and usually they go home the next day. This is, I'll just show you some examples of, you know, MRIs of tumors. So th this is a case I did. So this is a person, was a young woman who had a secretory tumor that was causing Cushing's disease. So she had high blood pressure, diabetes, a swollen face, um, enlargement of fat around the abdomen and the back of the neck. Um, the, again, this is a disease that we want to take care of because it, it causes a lot of other problems that can lead to, you know, heart attack, stroke, early death. So the first choice, again, is usually to operate. We went in through the transcendental route. Here was her tumor. It was a small tumor, but again, even a small tumor for Cushing's disease or acromegaly, usually we, we do recommend operating. I mean, unless the person is 90 or, or just, you know, if it's really, really going to be too dangerous, if they, you know, have had seven heart attacks, we, we could, one could argue to do the radio surgery up front, but usually we do transcendental surgery. Here she was before the surgery, and afterwards you can kind of see there's 
a little defect where we took out the little tumor and she was completely cured. After the surgery, her, and, and actually when Cushing's disease is treated successfully, often the level of cortisol in the body goes very low right after surgery and we have to replace it with a little hydrocortisone and then it ultimately can normalize, but she needed no further radiation or medicines or anything. So she did very well. And again, this is an example of what, you know, of, of a typical transphenoidal operation for, for, let's say, Cushing's. This is, this is an example of someone who had a non-secretory adenoma, and, and the, this is not the biggest one I've ever seen. It was just touching the optic nerves. Um, she had some bad frontal headaches between her eyes that I thought might have been from the tumor. Um, and we did decide, you know, we discussed it. We offered surgery. We again came through the endoscopic transsynoidal route, and the tumor was removed. And that's it. We're going to follow it. Probably she won't need any further, you know, her hormone level is fine. She had no issues, went home the next day, and likely she will not need any further radiation or medicines or anything. And her headaches immediately got better. Now, again, headaches are common. I'm not saying everybody with a headache, but in her case, she ha happened to have bad frontal headaches right between her eyes. Maybe this was the problem. And again, she said right after surgery, hey, my headaches are all better. But in any event, this is an example of how, you know, what it looks before and after the surgery. And here you can see a little of the defect of the bone that we removed you know, on our way in to get to the tumor. So what is radiosurgery? So stereotactic radiosurgery, Again, I will usually use after an operation if there's residual or in some cases as a first line treatment, but usually as a second line treatment. Um, and I will say I rarely end up operating more than once on a person with a pituitary tumor because I find that the super focused radiation does just as good a job as reoperating. Um, and, and again, there, there are tumors that get into areas like off to the side, into the cavernous sinus where it's you really can't safely operate without injuring the nerves in there. Um, sometimes tumors are firm, you can't safely remove them. So uh, one of the main, the two main devices I use, one is this is a machine called a gamma knife, which emits gamma radiation. And this is a, a machine called the Novalis. It's a type of linear accelerator, which emits X-rays or ray radiation. And there really isn't a difference specifically between gamma ray or x-ray, one unit of a gamma ray uh, does the same biological effect as one unit of an x-ray, but th the machines are used for different things. The gamma knife I, is for single session brain treatments. And we put a helmet on the head, they get an MRI the day of the procedure, it's a one morning treatment, and they come into this machine. Inside the machine, there are like almost 200 beams that are all we that we can focus on the tumor and can make the tumor whether malignant or benign disappear um the sometimes if the tumor is bigger um or it's against the object nerves i might choose to fraction do fractionated radio surgery in five sessions and then i might use a linear accelerator like this some people will use a linear accelerator for one session or three sessions these are also the machines one uses for Typical body radiation, if you had to do typical radiation in 20 or 30 sessions for a big area of the body. But again, often these machines can do super focused radiation as well. But for most of the time, for I'll do a one day, one morning treatment with gamma knife. But if the tumor is a bit bigger, I may do over five sessions with a novalis. And again, I rarely will operate more than once on a pituitary tumor. And this is just to show an example of you know, focus radiation for a pituitary tumor. So this was a gentleman. I had done a transphenol surgery several years earlier for a non-secretory tumor that was pressing up against his optic nerves, which are here. And then we didn't get all of it. And over time, some tumor started to regrow. And here's the tumor that was regrowing on a side view. And here's the, here's the optic nerves on the, the coronal view. Here's the tumor. It's growing a little more off to one side than the other. And Again, I feel that rarely do the, if you follow, first is I always follow everybody closely. All my brain tumor patients, uh, I follow them for life. I mean, so I'll, I'll say, okay, let's get an MRI in a year. Let's get one in two years. Let's get one in three years. 
but I'd rather find that if a tumor is coming back, I want to know about it earlier rather than later because that makes it easier to take advantage of this super focused option. So in this case, we found the tumor when it wasn't touching the nerves. We did a one day, one morning treatment outpatient with gamma knife, and the yellow is the uh, it indicates the 50th percentile of the dose. So that means that the, the let's say 100% of the dose is in the middle. This is 50%, and this shows like 40%, 30%. The key features of the radio surgery, which again I use a lot for brain tumors, facial pain, and vascular malformations of the brain. The two key features are one that the radiation is very conformal, which as you see it's very conformal to the tumor, and two that the fall off of the radiation is very fast. So as you see, it goes from 50 to 30 percentile, you know, within a millimeter or two. So the radiation dose to the optic nerves, which we want to minimize, was minimal. And what you see down here is a few years later, this tumor is completely gone. So, you know, and, and the person did not need medicines, they did beautifully. So again, I, while I like the, you know, a gentle, quick, easy, transsynoidal endoscopic approach for a lot of tumors. Um, sometimes I'll use this up front. Like let's say this, this person had a tumor that was found incidentally and started to grow. One might just do this up front. Um, but, but certainly for uh, after surgery, for recurrences, for residuals, I like the focused radiation. It's easier on the patient, lower risk. Uh, in rare cases after the re focused radiation, one may need to give some hormone replacement. Again, the main hormones would be either Synthroid or Hydrocortisone if needed, um, but usually not, and they do very well. And again, the key is you keep following with blood tests, you, you'll know what's the hormone status, and with the imaging, you'll know what is, you know, what does the tumor look like, and sometimes we will also use a neuro-ophthalmologist to get vision testing on people. I mean, if, if a person has a tiny tumor that's not touching the optic nerves, then we wouldn't expect any vision effects. But if the tumor is, you know, doing a lot of compression on the optic nerves, then having follow-up with the an ophthalmologist or neuro-ophthalmologist who can formally assess visual fields and detect small defects uh, would be worthwhile as well. So thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. I was gonna start by answering some questions that people gave me in advance, and then I guess we could go on to other questions that any of you may have. I'll also say that anybody who ever wants to reach me on can, can easily reach me. I give everyone my cell phone. You know, I try to make it easy. If you call my office, I do virtual visit. You know, if, if you live in China or wherever, I mean, and, and you know, wanna show me a disc and ask my, what do I think? I'll tell you it's not a big deal. Obviously, if you want me to treat you, you got to come to Long Island. I mean, I don't, I don't visit around the country, but I'm happy to to talk to anybody about things and and give you my thoughts about things. But so let me just start with a few questions that were asked to me in advance. Question one is: Do men experience different symptoms of a, a pituitary tumor than women? So the answer is yes. Um, one of the most common tumors is going to be the prolactinoma, which is more common in women and will often present in women with irregular menstrual periods and inability to conceive, inability to get pregnant, and can also cause galacteria or milky discharge from the breasts. So I would say that certainly that, that is the major difference is that in women, young women, we will often see um, prolactinomas that that prevent them from getting pregnant, which is less of an issue with men, but certainly both men and women can get pituitary tumors, but I would say that's probably the main difference. Next question, do all pituitary tumors secrete hormones? The answer is no. Um, again, some do, some do not, um, but even if they do not, they can affect the hormone status um, by either compressing the stalk and causing the prolactin to be elevated, or compressing the normal gland and causing the normal hormones to be reduced. Question three, do pituitary tumors spread into other parts of the brain? Uh, well, the answer is they can grow locally into the cavernous sinus or above the cella into the supracellar region towards the optic nerves, but it's pretty rare that they will grow much beyond that. Um, as far as 
metastasizing or spreading like a cancer to a different part of the brain or outside the body, that's very, very, very rare. And the good news is that pituitary cancers are extremely, extremely, extremely rare. Uh, now, now it, it is conceivable if you have a cancer of some other body part, like the breast, the lung, could it spread to the pituitary gland? Again, it could, but that's also very, very unlikely given the pituitary gland is such a tiny place. Next question, how fast do tumors grow? Does it depend on the person? Well, they do grow at different rates. I mean, most pituitary tumors, as I've mentioned, are tiny, benign, that many of us on this webinar right now probably have and don't know about and never will. So most of them are tiny and very, very, very slow growing. That having been said, some of them can grow faster and can become quite large and in those cases may require surgery or, or, or intervention. Are most pituitary tumors benign? Uh, the answer is yes, not only most, but almost all. I would say 99.9% of pituitary tumors are benign, very, 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 in in my, in my 24 years in practice on Long Island, I only saw one person with, with a, a cancerous pituitary tumor, fortunately almost all benign. Um, question, besides an endocrinologist and a neurosurgeon, should I be seeing other specialists? Well, again, I've mentioned if the tumor is compressing the optic nerves and you're having vision problems, seeing an eye doctor would, would be sensible. Uh, people often need to see internists, uh, and, and there are other people you're gonna be seeing for other reasons, like your cardiologist, other people, but it's often a neurosurgeon, endocrinologist. It may also be your OBGYN if you're dealing with fertility problems, and that's, that's how it was discovered. You'll be talking to them a lot about getting the hormones under control so you can have a baby. Um, Question, what causes pituitary tumors? Well, it, I would say it's what the same thing that causes most benign tumors, which is every cell in the body has a nucleus with DNA, and part of the DNA, which tells the cell what to do, also tells the cell how fast to grow. And if you have a, a def, if that part of the DNA breaks, then that cell can now grow a little faster. And if it's a benign break, then now you have two of those cells with the same defect, and, it, and then those two cells gradually turn into four cells, et cetera. But almost always, pituitary tumors are benign, and, and they all, almost always just happen to form. In rare cases, people can have um, certain syndromes or, or that can be congenital called multiple endocrine neoplasia, where there's tumors of pituitary gland and other glands, but those are quite rare. And also, I suppose, conceivably, if somebody was exposed to radiation uh, to, to their head, let's say as a child, that might make a, a tumor more likely of the pituitary or anywhere else. But I would say almost all these just happen on their own, and they just happen because of a, of, of a minor defect to the DNA of one of the pituitary cells. Um, next question, is a pituitary tumor life-threatening? Well, the main scenario where they could become life-threatening is if they're causing is by causing too much or, or too little of certain hormones um, one scenario again is apoplexy where all of a sudden somebody can go blind or all of a sudden somebody has no cortisol or no thyroid hormone in their body now you need some cortisol to live so if you suddenly have no cortisol and you don't go to the hospital, I mean, you, you, that could be life-threatening. Similarly, if you have an excess of cortisol with Cushing's disease, or you have an excess of growth hormone with acromegaly, th that can also cause systemic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, or cardiac arrhythmias that can also be life-threatening. Fortunately, there are good treatments for those, and fortunately, most pituitary tumors are, are never gonna be life-threatening in, in any case. Uh, they may gradually cause some problems that we can often treat. So that's all That's all the questions I had, and I'm open for more questions now. And again, if anybody ever wants to reach me, you call me on Long Island, and I'm happy to call you back or review your case and help in any way I can. I mean, and also the internet, by the way, is a wonderful resource. You can easily watch any kind of surgery, watch radio surgery, read up about things. I think knowledge is, 
is a good thing because you know you'll you'll learn you can learn a lot but thank you i hope this was helpful and i'm happy to take any further questions anyone might have okay thank you so much for such an informative presentation dr brisman we do have a couple questions that came through um more than one person asked what your general opinion of having yearly mris after a recurring tumor is um well so so the answer is i think it depends what the tumor is doing i mean if we know that the, the person has a tumor i will definitely start with you know i will always get some follow-up mris now let's say you follow it for you know 50, 10 years and there's been no change i mean one might get another one in five years so but i think you always want to get some follow-up if there's a known tumor there even if it's an incidental tumor i'll do some follow-ups i might get a follow-up in two years or three years but you know you'll get a sense of how fast the tumor is growing and then adjust the timing of the mri accordingly and if the thing isn't doing anything i might say you know let's get one in 10 years or you don't need any mris but i will usually get some follow-up images on most patients but i will t stretch them out depending on what's going on if i have three mris over three years that show no change then i might say let's see you in three more years rather than getting one every year but i do think you the only way to know if a tumor is coming back is to get a picture okay thank you next question is i had surgery and radiation for cushing's disease eight years ago and have had chronic sinus problems ever since my ENT has gone in surgically to try and alleviate the problem with not much success. How common is this problem following surgery and radiation? So I would say I, I have not heard of even one case. I, I think that's rare. Obviously, it can happen. Uh, the surgery itself doesn't usually cause, you know, too much permanent sinus problems. And the radiation is usually going to be focused on the pituitary gland. So I would say I'm sorry you're experiencing that. That sounds rare, but certainly that's gonna be in the realm of the ear, nose, and throat doctor. Um, and there are different things one can do, whether it's saline you know, sprays to the nose, other types of sprays to the nose, antihistamines, I mean, antibiotics if an infection flares up. Sometimes a humidifier when, when a person sleeps at night may be helpful, but there are a lot of things that one can do for that. And I, but that's definitely in the realm of an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And I would say my experience is that that's very, very rare that a person has serious, you know, long-term sinus problems from one of these procedures. And certainly the way we do it now endoscopically, I, I would say it's very rare, and I, I hope you feel better. Okay, thank you. The next question is, after a transphenoidal surgery to remove a macroadenoma and the pituitary gland no longer functions. Do you feel that small doses of HGH can improve the quality of life in adults? So I haven't heard. Which provides steroids to the body because a person has to have some steroids. Two is you're going to have to take something like Synthroid to replace the thyroid, because you must have a certain amount of thyroid hormone in the body to live. And the third is DDAVP or Desmopressin, because without that, you're gonna be urinating a liter of urine every hour and you have to constantly drink. So those three hormones you have to have. As far as using growth hormone, I'm not aware of people using that, and it's unclear the need for growth hormone as an adult. Um, I mean, certainly if, if it were a child, yes, you would need that. But as an adult, I think it's unclear, and, and that's where I would leave it. I don't use it, but there, there may be some subtle things that it causes that we don't know about yet. But currently, I don't think that's considered standard to give everybody growth hormone. Okay, thank you. Question, what treatment paths are there when the tumor doesn't appear on an MRA? Okay, well, if the tumor doesn't appear, I'm assuming you said an MRI, right? So if the tumor doesn't appear on an MRI, I mean, the question is, is there a tumor at all? I mean, the reason to think there would be a tumor is, I'm assuming that the hormone, the, there's either an, 
a significant elevation of prolactin, a significant elevation of, of cortisol, or a significant elevation of growth hormone. So if there's a significant elevation of prolactin and we, we don't see anything, let, let's say the prolactin's 100, a woman can't get pregnant, and the MRI, we, we're not sure if there's something tiny there or not, we would give cabergoline or bromocryptine, and that would normalize the level. If, if there's an elevation of cor the, the cortisol or the, or the growth hormone, one question is, is it possible that it's coming from somewhere else? In rare cases, you can have other tumors in the body that lead to extra cortisol or extra growth hormones. You would first work up, work up that possibility and try to confirm that that was not the case. As far as exploring the pituitary gland, I mean, if a person had Cushing's disease, we were sure that it was coming from the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland really looked totally normal. One option would be to just explore the gland and see if you could find something. Another might be focused radiation. Um, same thing with growth hormone. But I would say those cases are becoming much more rare as we have, again, MRIs that are getting better and better. Sometimes also for Cushing's disease, people will do something called petrosal sinus sampling, where they test hormone levels um, from the veins that are leaving the pituitary gland to see if they can localize a tumor to one side or the other. But I would say that's rarely an issue uh, as MRIs are getting better and better, but it would depend on the case. Okay. Um, one more question. Is it easier to recover if you go through the nose instead of opening up the top of the brain? Uh, it is much easier if you go through the nose. So the first is, it, I think people are rarely, rarely going through the top of the brain, which is, you know, we call it craniotomy or opening of the cranium. And we would usually only do a craniotomy for a pituitary tumor if it was enormous or really growing, you know, into an area that's, you know, really far forward or back or up in a, in a really unusual way. So that's a big operation. That require, you know, and that's a, much, a longer hospital stay, a longer, more complicated recovery. Uh, the transphenoidal route, you don't really go through the brain at all. You really go through the nose, and it takes an hour. People are up and about a few hours later, and they go home the next day. So I would say that the almost always for pituitary tumors, we use the transphenoidal route, and it's because you know it's just the better route, and it's much better tolerated than the cranial route, which again is rarely, rarely needed, you know, unless the tumor is just enormous and there's something very unusual about it. Um, so yeah, the, the, the endoscopic transphenol route is, is much easier, well, better tolerated, much easier to recover from. Okay, thank you. And then we had a couple more questions come through and then sure. we will wrap it up. Um, could you please say if you've heard of any complications going off of cabr Galene after 20 years of treatment for a microprolactinoma? Uh, I don't know that I've heard of a, I mean, complication of coming off cabergoline. Sometimes if people are on the cabergoline um, for a while, they can come off it and the tumor never regrows. Now, one possibility is if you come off the cabergoline, the tumor could start to grow again and the prolactin might increase, but it may not. Uh, so I have not heard of someone having like Certainly, the, I wouldn't say withdrawal, but I haven't heard of that. But that's not to say it's impossible. Um, and one could Google it, and, and maybe there is such a thing. But other than the fact that the tumor might recur and the prolactin levels might become elevated again, uh, I haven't heard of it, but it's not impossible. OK, and what if the remaining tumor after surgery is wrapped around the carotid artery? Is it still? it is still secreting some growth hormone. So, so the question is what to do in that case? Yes, I believe so. Okay, so sometimes the tumors, again, are in easy to get to place, which is like the cellar, supercellar area right in the middle. The tumors can grow off into hard to get to places like the cavernous sinus, which includes the carotid artery. I mean, if a tumor grows into that area, I don't even try to take it out. I think it's high risk to try to take it out. And I would do a gamma knife or you know, other radiosurgery, but probably gamma knife to treat that tumor. Often 
the radio surgery will normalize the hormone level with time. It, I mean, it doesn't happen instantly, but it may occur over a year or two. Uh, simultaneous with that, for elevated growth hormone, people would be on some medicines that will also try to normalize the, the main uh, blood level that we're looking for in growth hormone is the end product called IGF-1. And so you would, one is I would not reoperate. One is I would do the focus radiation because it's possible that will normalize the hormone and cure the tumor and prevent further growth. But simultaneously, I would use, have the endocrinologist use medicines to, to keep the growth hormone and the IGF-1 level in normal range. And it's possible that over time, as the radiation kicks in, uh, that you may be able to come off those medicines. But I would not try to surgically remove the tumor from the carotid artery or anywhere in the cavernous sinus or anywhere that isn't just e easy to get to for the, because I feel that you get equivalent results from the focused radiation of the medicines, which are much less invasive. Okay. Thank you. And what is your experience with using cabergoline with for non-functional tumors? Um, I guess I, I, my feeling is it's not used for that. I mean, now there may be a case where we're not sure if it's a prolactinum or not. You know, let's say you have a tumor that's medium size, the prolactin is 120, is it because it's compressing the stalk or is it because it's a prolactinoma and one might use cabergoline to tr and see if it shrinks and then that that would tell you hey it's a it's a prolactinoma but if it's not secretory then i don't think there is a role for that some people talk about using cabergoline for some some refractory cases of acromegaly or cushings although i think that's not the primary treatment for that but I think for an for a tumor that's clearly not producing any hormones, I, I don't think there's any benefit, or I'm not aware of any benefit to using cabergoline in that scenario. And there are some risks to all these medicines. So so I, I, I have not ever used cabergoline for a tumor that I knew to be non-secretory. Okay, thank you. And this will be our final question. I have recurrent treatment resistant Cushing's, have had three transphenoidal surgeries already. If there's no visible tumor on the MRI, how is radiotherapy targeted and what is the success rate? What are the risks and what are the side effects? And if there's no visible tumor on an MRI, I presume cells could be outside the cellar. Presumably, this could mean that radiotherapy does not target these cells and therefore would not be successful. How, does, how long does radiotherapy take to work? Okay, so so first is I'm going to assume that the the first pers this person clearly had Cushing's disease where there was a, a Cushing a pituitary tumor was the cause of the excess uh, cortisol level and that tumor was removed and they couldn't get all of it out of the pituitary gland. Um, so first of all, I I would use I would do radiosurgery treatment in this case and I would focus the radiation on the pituitary region. Um, it's possible that there could end up being some hypopituitarism is a possibility, as it always is. One may have to replace hydrocortisone or synthroid, but I think there's a very good chance with, and we use slightly higher doses when we're trying to treat uh, secretory tumors, but I think one could, I would treat the pituitary region, which is most likely where the tumor is, and there's only so many places it could be hiding, but I would treat the, the pituitary region with radiosurgery. Now, some people have suggested things like just cutting out the pituitary gland, but this, I think, is less invasive and does the same thing. And I would not have a, you know, a fourth operation. Like, I don't even do more than one operation usually. So I would do radiosurgery, and at the same time, I would use medicines. Um, people used to do other, you know, things, but I, like cutting out the pituitary gland or doing surgery on the adrenal gland. I, I, I would not do that. but I would do the focus radiation. The focus radiation, I think, has a very good chance of working, not 100%, and would take, you know, a year or two or three to normalize the the uh, the cortisol level. But in the meantime, I would use medicines. So I would do the radio surgery now to the pituitary cella region. I would start medicines, and if over time levels normalize, then you might be able to come off the medicines. But that that's what I would do. 
Okay, thank you. This will conclude today's webinar presentation. We really appreciate you, Dr. Brisman, and your wonderful presentation. Um, if you missed any part of this webinar today or if you would like to share it with family members or friends, it will be available on our website at www.pituitary.org after it is edited. There will be a brief survey after the webinar. Please feel free to fill it out and help us provide you with it, uh, any information that you need. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Bisman.